we're continuing on today with that story. But first, a little review. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Kings chapter 5. That's where we were. That's where we will be for today, like last week. 2 Kings chapter 5, towards the end of what we read, this is what it says. So he went down and dipped himself. This is 2 Kings 5, 14, 15, 16. We'll we'll introduce that with this verse. So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times. We're talking about Naaman. As the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Do you see that in the Bible? Remember that? Then Naaman and all his attendants, after he was healed, went back to the man of God, Elisha. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet Elisha answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. Even though Naaman urged him, he refused. Verses 14, 15, and 16 show us the gratitude and the praise of someone who was healed. Naaman received his miraculous healing. Naaman showed what we said last week, displayed faith, humility, and obedience. Remember this, some of you that were here, some of you that were not and failed to hear that, you could go back onto Facebook or YouTube and read that again or go through it again. But Naaman's faith, his humility, and his obedience to the word of God through the prophet were all ingredients that helped make this miraculous recipe. Naaman comes back to Elisha, of course, with sincere gratitude. You're talking about a career-ending, life-threatening disease that because of his faith, humility, and obedience to the Lord, God healed him. So he says, wow, fresh start, second chance. Let me go back and just, just express my gratitude. Of course, he was powerful and wealthy. Naaman comes back to Elisha with gratitude and generous gifts for him. Elisha says, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept anything from you. Naaman was, No, 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 no. This is just for you. I'm I'm really so happy. I'm so glad. I want to thank you. You know, I, I believe in your God now. Nope. Maybe that's the purpose, Elisha would say. I will not accept anything from you. At the end of that conversation, he says, go in peace. A very, a very good, poignant way of saying, we're all good. We're all good. Go in peace. He says, shalom to you. Naaman, with all his joy, goes away. Now we get to our verse for today. You ready? You have your Bibles, go again to verse, same verse, a few verses down, starting from verse 19, the second part. After Naaman had traveled some distance, remember he left already, all joyful and happy. Gehazi, verse 20, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, My master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from his chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? He asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. 
my master sent me to say, two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. Oh, by all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them and then tied up, tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. He gave them to two of his servants and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. Look at verse 24. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent them away and they left. When he went in and stood before his master, Elisha asked him, hmm, Where have you been, Gehazi? Oh, your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. Verse 26, But Elisha said to him, Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money? Is this the time to accept clothes or olive groves and vineyards or flocks and herds or male and female slaves? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence and his skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. What a pointed story talking about the curse of greed. It's a curse, let me tell you. And it happens in the same story of a miracle. And this story, that's how the cursed sinner, I'll put that here. Oh, can you remove that title already? Because we know the title already. That's how the cursed sinner became a cleansed servant and how the cleansed servant became a cursed sinner. It can happen. It can happen even to the best. A good reminder, especially as we enter this season in our culture, you know, when the cold starts to happen like this, some of, your, some of our minds turn to material stuff. Greed, covetousness, materialism, general term for it, worldliness, starts to become the norm. Let me tell you, we have to guard against it. We have to repent of it. We have to keep ourselves away from greed and its invisible tentacles. They grip our hearts. They grip our minds. They take over our attention. They take over our affection, our, our ambitions, and our aspirations and take us away from the things of God. The Bible says, set your hearts, set your minds on things above. Materialistic culture, a worldly culture, fosters greed, covetousness, materialism. And the people of God, if we're not careful, if we're not guarding it, we can fall easily into this trap and get ourselves into that curse, the curse of greed. The story of Naaman was miraculous. It tells us that the story of Gehazi now, on, in contrast, was tragic. Gehazi had a good beginning. Remember, Gehazi, who was the master? Elisha. Who was Elisha's master? Elijah. God called Elijah. Powerfully, chariots of fire, Mount Carmel. Then, when he was about to go, Elisha was anointed. A double portion of that anointing. Remember that story? Elisha takes over. Armies come, they attack, but they're scared off because God was with Elisha. Powerful, powerful man of God. Who was next in line? Gehazi. We remember Elijah for that power. We remember Elisha for that anointing, but we remember Gehazi for his greed and materialism. Great beginnings do not guarantee great endings. 
Some of us began well with our relationship with God. It was a mountaintop high. But are you still there? Or has it gone off track? <clears throat> Here's a few points to ponder a little more when we talk about this curse of greed. Let's remove the title now for all. <clears throat> First thing I want you to think about, how does that happen? How does someone like Gehazi, who has witnessed a lot of powerful, miraculous things in front of him, how does he slip into and get himself into the curse of greed? Gehazi had the wrong idea, the wrong attitude about God's grace. He did not understand it. He monetized it. He had the wrong idea about God's miraculous power. That's why he said, my master, my master Elisha, he was too easy. He was too easy on Naaman. Let him go, just like that. After such a powerful miracle, and he did bring with him, remember, a lot of gifts, a lot of riches in the millions. If we were trans translated today, we're talking about silver and gold and stuff in the millions. And he was prepared to give it all to Elisha. But Elisha said, go in peace. Gehazi's like, what? Bye. He's looking at the gold that's glittering. My master was too easy on Naaman. Underestimating the plan and the purpose of God for Elisha. The plan and the purpose of God for Naaman. And how that all fits in. He, he was underestimating. He was thinking it's all about, well, God gave you this, then you give that. He had his own idea of how the enemies of Israel should be paid. He was angry at how someone like Naaman, a commander of the army of the enemy, the enemy was the Arameans, the Syrians. And he was like, what? Now he's sick. Now he's calling for mercy upon our God. And now that he's healed, he gets off free. This is God's idea of grace. But see, he had a wrong idea about God's grace. Do you see that in the story? He had a spirit of hatred, a hatred towards the Arameans. Remember Jonah? Jonah was sent to the Ninevites. Nineveh was also a, an enemy of Israel. When he preached there, God forgave them. What did Jonah say? I knew it. See, God, see? I knew you were loving and kind and gracious. See, when I preached to them, now they repented. What kind of a God are you? What kind of people are these? There was a spirit of hatred, a misunderstanding, a wrong attitude towards God's movement and God's grace. Add that wrong spirit of hatred to a sense of entitlement. This is the work of God. Do you receive from the word of God? Hello. And he, was, he felt he was entitled to some of that. He felt that because he was representing a miraculous God and he was part of the work of God, somehow this God's grace, you know, cha-ching. His sense of justice and fairness were warped. Oh, <laughs> do you know some people in your home? <laughs> Or some people that you know are friends or, that have a wrong or warped sense of fairness and justice. Some of us think that our sense of righteousness, fairness, and justice is God's sense of fairness and justice. Not so. Not so. Our anger does not bring forth the righteousness of God. That's what James says. Hmm. His sense of justice and fairness were warped. He felt that Elijah... This, look at this disrespect. He felt Elisha, his master, was wrong. He got this wrong. Oh, my master, let him, too, let him off too easy. The, the curse of greed starts out with a wrong attitude, a wrong perspective, a wrong way of looking at something like grace. 
Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor. And this is what he said. Everything can be taken from a man but one thing. To choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. He chose by his own doing to look at God's miraculous work in terms of a sense of entitlement and the spirit of hatred. Do you see that in the story? That's all contributing to the curse of greed. Number two, greed gripped Gehazi's heart. And you need to see this in the story. It gripped his heart way before he started acting upon it. Way before. Maybe Naaman was still on his way with his entourage, his caravan. They were on his way and they could hear, he could hear the, the jingling of the, of the gold and the silver and the riches that would come. It's like, ah, oh, yes. I can't wait on what God will do and what this person, what? Free? The grace, free? Something happened in his heart when he saw that sense of entitlement, spirit of hatred. He said, oh, as surely as the Lord lives. Did you see that when he said that? I will run and get something from him. I'm going to get some. I, I, at least something. I'm entitled to something. I'm going to run and get something from him. It started in his heart when he saw it. Something uh, moved in him. Oh, I want that. I desire that. I covet that. Oh. If only at that point, if only he resisted that urge, controlled his desire, and confessed it to the Lord or to Elisha, this would not happen. It's a usual pattern. He saw, he coveted, he acted upon it. Then he covered it up. Then he suffered the consequence. You see that everywhere in the Bible. You see that he saw, he coveted, he acted, he covered it up. Then he suffered the consequence. You see David. You see Achan. You see a lot of other people. Uh, in the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira, the same. In fact, Gehazi is compared to the Ananias and Sapphira, Sapphira of, uh, of the New Testament. Remember them? They were the ones stealing from the Lord's work. James chapter 4, verse. And let, let me give you a few verses to remind you of how you need to guard your heart. It says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. James chapter 4, verse 7. We like that. We like this part. We like the part that says, Resist the devil and he will flee. And we always quote that. Oh, just resist the devil and he will flee. You're forgetting the first part. Submit yourselves to God. Surrender to God out of worship, reverence, and praise. Then you will resist and he will flee. Submit first. Then you can resist. Have God change your heart first then it will be easier to stand against the enemy's attacks. Why don't we? Why don't we submit? Pride. Pride. <laughs> Pride is a close cousin of greed. They're related. Anywhere you see pride, you will see greed. Anywhere you see greed, there will be pride. They're closely associated. He acted upon that evil desire, and greed was born in his heart. So, are you seeing the, the anatomy here? If we were to do an autopsy, and we were to look at his heart, there we will see the problem. The heart of the problem is a problem of the heart. It was full of plaques. The arteries were clogging. Why? It's full of materialism. It's full of worldliness. It's full of stuff. 
that are not setting your hearts and your minds on things above. We're talking about stuff that you and I have, stuff that you and I enjoy, stuff that you and I desire. Careful, because that starts to build up plaque in your heart. There's pride, there's greed. The curse happens. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Ayun naman pala, pastor. There you go. Money is bad. Get rid of your money. No. Does it say that? No. For the love of money, the desire to get rich, the desire to have more, is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Paul was telling Timothy, you be careful. You work for the Lord. You be careful. Jesus is in you. Guard your heart against the love, the desire for material things. It's all temporary anyway. You're going to leave this all behind. Wait, did I surprise some of you? You're going to leave that behind. What's your, your favorite gadget, your favorite car? How about your investments here and abroad? How about the numbers that add up and say, I'm secure, I'm stable. I'm telling you, when you die, and you will, you're all going to leave that. Amen? Are, are you? Like, of course, of course, Pastor, I know that. But why are you living in such a way that as if you were not? Why are you living so attached to it that it starts to bother your heart and clog up your arteries? That's what happened to Gehazi. Even while he was involved in the ministry and seeing this power of things God was doing, his heart, his heart was not submitted to God. Be careful of your heart. Look at Proverbs 4, 23. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Ah, oh, wow. What do our friends in Korea say? Guard your heart. But the evil pastor. It's the title of a movie, Be Careful of My Heart. I'm telling you, be careful of your heart. That's funny. I know. <laughs> Sorry for those that love Korean dramas. But be careful of your heart, what you're exposing it to. Amen? You know what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm prone to that too. I, you have that tendency. We, all do, we live in a culture that celebrates that. We're entering a time and a season where materialism is king. Mm. Be careful of your heart. See, if you're not careful of your heart, lying is easy. You know, this lying and cover up were actually second sins. Look at the, the story. The lying and the cover up were second sins. The curse of greed was first. What was he covering up? What was he lying about? The greed that he started to act on. So your lie and my lie, they're actually second sins because you're covering up. Oh, that other lie is covering up the other lie that covers up for the other lie. As surely as the Lord lives, he says, he, he dragged this heart problem, he dragged Elijah's name the respectable, anointed name of Elisha. Uh, Naaman, uh, my master Elisha sent me. Dragged him into it. Then, um, it's like this. There's two prophets from Ephraim. He dragged even the work of the Lord into his greed. He was lying to cover up that, to cover that up. And he dragged even the Lord's name into it. As surely, oh, oh, as surely as the Lord lives. I'm telling you, we need that. I'm going to get something from you at the back of his mind. The lying and the cover-up become easy. It becomes easier and easier. Some people lie too much that they stumble even with what they said yesterday. 
Oh, have you met people like this? Are there people like this? Yes, they're lies upon lies, but they're so used to it, that's their language. <laughs> everything okay, Gehazi? Oh, everything's fine. No, everything was not fine. Greed has taken his heart already. And at that point, he was like, mm -hmm, gold, 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 silver, silver, silver. Cha-ching, cha-ching. His heart. As surely as the Lord lives, we need this. The lying comes easy for those that have fallen into it. Careful. If you find someone, that's why. Up to Revelation, they said liars go to church. Oh, no, no. Oh, liars go to hell. Sorry. But you know what I'm talking about. The lie, the cover up, the, stri the scheming, the conniving, that's already secondary. What has happened? The heart has already fallen to sin at that point for Gehazi. So, let's remember. And the last point. Gehazi's greed has serious consequences. Oh, we know that. But not only for him, but even for those around him. Look at what Elisha declares and pronounces upon Gehazi. Naaman's leprosy, the one that you saw God took away from Naaman, it'll cling to you and your descendants forever. What? Yes. What I took away, God says, what I took away from him when he dipped in faith, humility, and obedience, I will curse you with it. Oh, not only you. I'm so mad at how you have failed to see this curse taking a grip of your heart and how you have used my name and used the name of the, the, the work of the Lord and your master. That is going to be upon you and your descendants forever. What? He left that place a leper. Brothers and sisters, in case you did not know, sin has its payback. Sin always has its consequences. Amen? Some of you know this. Some of you have suffered through it. Some of you are suffering through some of that. Enduring it. Hopefully, by God's grace, you make it through. Galatians 6 and 7. We've preached about this many times. Galatians 6 and 7 says this. Do not be deceived. Do not fool yourselves. God cannot be mocked. You can fool God. You can fool yourself. You can fool others. You can fool even the people of God. But you cannot mock God. You cannot fool God. Nothing is hidden from Him. A man reaps what he sows. You sow in sin, you will reap in sin. You sow in the Spirit, you will reap in the Spirit, Galatians says. You may enjoy it now, but later on, you will pay. It's like a credit card. <laughs> enjoy now, pay later. You talk to your person to the left or the right. Tell them, you will pay. Those of you online, you will pay. You know that. What did the famous dermatologist say? Today's tanned beauties are tomorrow's wrinkled prunes. <laughs> what? Sama naman, Pastor. Where's the love? Today's tanned beauties are tomorrow's wrinkled prunes. Sin will pay more than you wanted to pay. Will make you pay more than you wanted to pay. Sin will make you stay longer than you wanted to stay. Sin will destroy more than you were willing to risk initially. And it will cost you more than you calculated for. That's how sin works. It has a multiplier effect. His leprosy was inherited by his sons too. Can you imagine growing up as a teenager? What is this? My children and my grandchildren. 
what happened? And they will be asking that question. So why? How? Why me? Why now? And the answer will be, it's because of our ancestor Gehazi. It's the curse of greed upon him that we, innocent as we are, but because we're related to him, are suffering the consequences of. Ouch. I mean, you got to be affected by this somehow. I understand that my sin will affect me. Some of us have calculated that. We're paying for that. But if it starts to affect innocent people just because they're related to you, just because they're associated with you, there's there's unfairness to that, right? As far as we're concerned. So we be careful not to sin, not to offend a holy God so that we enjoy His blessings. And the same thing, the blessings will be enjoyed undeservedly, but for generations to come. But the curse of sin happens and is passed on to generation to generation too. Sin has its consequences and it's suffered by people around you. Always more than you bargained for. There is no hiding from God. He knows. Amen. And He knows you. And He knows your heart. Yet He loves you. He loves you. Gives you a chance. Maybe for some, today is that chance. Gehazi had no unexplained sins, only an unguarded heart. You see that? There's no hiding, but you need to guard your heart. We need to see how far away from sin we can get sometimes, not how close we can be to it without falling. We like we like tempting ourselves. We like putting ourselves in situations where we will almost fall. And then when we do, we have no one else to blame but ourselves. The problem is when our, the consequences of our sin, our, the greed, materialism, and covetousness start to affect not just us, but the people around us. Be mindful. Amen? Let me tell you the last story. Well, I'll show you the last slide. That's not the last slide. I'll go back. That is the last, last slide. <clears throat> that is the last slide. There's a story, Leo Tolstoy. You all remember? Uh, uh, yes. Leo Tolstoy is a famous Russian writer. He told this while reflecting on human nature. We learn a lot from him. A peasant was told that he could have all the land he could, that he could walk on within one day. So, poor, poor peasant in Russia was, tell, was told, all the land that you can walk on in one day is yours. From sunrise to sunset, where he sets his foot on, it's his. Wow, right? Bonanza. Only, only, by sundown, he must be back at his starting point. So wherever he starts here in the sunrise, wherever he sets his foot on, that's his. As long as he makes it back to his starting point on sunset. His heart started to pound as he envisioned owning great properties and great riches. Early in the morning, at sunrise, he began walking, remembering that every foot of land on which he steps on is now his. His walk became a jog, became a run. And it turned into a run at breakneck speed. Because the, the faster he goes, the more land he covers. He was so engrossed with how much that was, he forgot, I need to be back halfway too, right? But it was way past half time. So he started going back, running back. Remember that agreement by sundown. He must have returned to his starting point. However, his greed was so great. He spent more than half his time before he actually turned back. He had to run at top speed just to beat the sunset. Oh, he struggled. 
He was thinking of all that riches. He struggled. If he were not at the starting point, he'd lose it all. Finally, finally, he made it. But as his foot touched the starting point, just at the stroke of sunset, he fell and died from exhaustion. All that he gained in the end was enough land six feet deep to bury his dead body. That was his final inheritance. Oh, wow. It's gold already, but it became stone. It was to his death. He was not careful of his heart. That's why I say, above all, guard your heart. Guard it against the curse of greed. Amen. Let's stand up. Let's pray.